and also for <coughs> continuing to have a mix of projects under this this program. Appreciate that. Um, I think then that we are at our close enough to our one o'clock time certain Sorry. that we will, thank you very much, Brian, that we will move to um, item G for a time certain and we'll hear the memorandum of agreement between the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua and Sayusla Indians and ODFNW. And it looks like Davia will do the introduction of this one and I'll let the others introduce themselves. Welcome, and would you like to start off, Davia? Um, good morning, or good afternoon, Chair um, Director Melcher, members of the commission. For the record, I'm Davia Palmieri, Acting Deputy Director for Fish and Wildlife Programs, and um, I'll have my colleagues here introduce themselves. <coughs> Excuse me. Hi, my name is Brad Nieper. I'm the Tribal Chair for the Kuswam Kwan Sayusla Tribes. Good afternoon. I'm, good afternoon. I'm Rick Eichstead. I serve as Tribal Attorney. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair Nieper and Henrik. Um, I'm really excited to be bringing this exhibit to the commission today. Um, Chair Nieper and his team have some remarks about the tribe's history on the coast of Oregon. They're interested in working with the department on this. Um, but I just really want to reiterate for the department um, how important these uh, management agreements are. Um, a great opportunity um, to expand the pace and scale of habitat restoration in the areas of interest for the tribe. Um, that are really critical, need, critically needed in Southwest Oregon in particular and um, key interest for the department. Um, the department's mission is to protect and enhance Oregon's fish and wildlife and their habitats for use and enjoyment by present and future generations. The mission aligns with long held tribal governance, um, their knowledge of maintaining functioning habitats and their care for the plants and wildlife that has sustained the tribe um, since time immemorial. Um, so I, have given a similar presentation to the commission twice in the last year. I'm going to abbreviate a little bit because this agreement that we're presenting today is, is substantially the same. Um, and so I'll, I'll start by handing off to Chair Niebuhr to make any comments he'd like to begin with. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, I have a short um, so set of I comments here, and I'll try to make them really quick because I know time is of the essence as always. Year, as I've said, uh, my name is Brad Nieper. I'm the tribal chair for the Confederate Tribes of the Coos, Warm Con, Sayusla Indians, um, and, so and I'm a Sayusla person. Um, and I'm honored to be here to represent my tribe before you today. Our tribe was recognized or restored as a federally recognized tribe in 1984. Since that time, tribal government has grown in size and capabilities. Our population is over 1,320 members scattered across the country. Uh, however, the, the biggest concentration of our population is in Coos, Lane, Douglas, Curry, and Lincoln counties. Um, prior to my retirement, just over two years ago, uh, I worked for the tribe for 17 years as chief of police um, after having developed the department for the tribe. Um, prior to that, I worked for the Oregon State Police uh, for 17 years as a patrol officer detective and patrol sergeant, so I know the importance of enforcement and regulation. Um, when I was elected to tribal council just over a year ago, uh, after my, a year after my retirement as well, uh, one of my goals was to move the tribe uh, toward recognition of our ability uh, to help manage the environment um, around us. Uh, since time memorial, our people have hunted, fished, gathered, and been stewards of the lands uh, covered in this Grand regulation. Um, even starting this process for us was difficult and complicated because of the verbiage in our tribal constitution forbade any kind of negotiation or uh, um, discussion about tribal uh, hunting and fishing rights. So we had to have a special election uh, to do that. We had, um, and there were some high bars set in that election. It wasn't just a simple election. So we had a record turnout and we had a single no vote on this issue. So that kind of demonstrates the importance uh, to the tribal uh, membership on this topic. 
The tribal government consists of many departments and forms, many functions uh, serving our members. Among those departments are our forest department, which is a newer department, um, but growing. And our Department of Natural Resources and Culture, DNR, as I'll call them from here on. Uh, within that department, we have specialists who work on many environmental projects. Uh, between 2014 to present, the tribe has implemented 1.67 million in restoration projects, benefiting fish and wildlife, including uh, the Wake Ranch Tidal Wetland Restoration Project, the North Fork Sayuslaw uh, River Habitat Restoration Project, and the Five Mile Bell uh, Restoration Project. The tribe is active in collaborative restoration efforts benefiting fish and wildlife in our ancestral territory. Uh, uh, including the Sykes Lock Coho Partnership, the Coos Coho Partnership, and Ten Mile Lakes Basin Partnership. Uh, we have state, uh, state of the Art Laboratory uh, that, among other things, can test water quality for toxins and contaminants. We do that regularly uh, on any lands that we and we do it for others as well. We can actually contract out uh, that that capability. The tribe is an outspoken advocate for the protection of the fish and wildlife habitat. We work closely with the state to address, address uh, the impacts of the proposed, uh, or we did work closely with the state uh, to address the impacts of the proposed Jordan Cove Energy Project uh, and our work in the state and local interest to address the potential impacts of the proposed offshore wind energy uh, development on fish and wildlife, fish and marine wildlife. Um, our tribal police department is also expanding and is in the process of putting our first fish and wildlife officer out in the, our tribal lands. Uh, we have made the commitment to work with the state and other tribes, particularly those with overlapping service areas to protect the environment and cultural resources and fish and wildlife populations. Our tribe takes the responsibility of stewardship of our lands and everything living on those lands very seriously. We will be adopting policies and codes to help us meet that responsibility now and in the future. And that's not to say we haven't already been doing that for many years, but it will be uh, enhanced. Uh, now I'd like to say just a couple of words about what this means to me. Uh, I grew up in a hunting and fishing family, and I have a lot of memories of going out with my grandfather hunting. And um, even when we weren't successful, um, that time out in the, in the forest was very important to me, as it is today. And um, being able to do that under the umbrella of the tribal also responsibilities is extremely important, and it just, I can't even describe what that does for me, and I know that does the same for, for many other tribal members as well. In fact, my nephew, my great-nephew actually is going to say a few words in the public comment time period. Um, so this, I kind of got off track here. Um, so uh, also responsible. On that note, I will say thank you for your time, and I look forward to working with you all, uh, Director Melcher, uh, Ms. Palmieri, and the staff for the betterment of the tribes, or the, uh, excuse me, of the lands we all live in, and thank you very much. And as I said, my grandson, our great nephew, will be speaking. Thank you. I look forward to hearing from you. Did you, was there also going to be testimony from you? Or? Okay. <laughs> He's here to keep me out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best thing to do. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Chair Nefer. Um, so this uh, management agreement is um, extremely similar um, to the agreements that the commission approved with the Coqual tribe in June of 2022 and um, the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua tribe of Indians in 2022 as well. Um, so we will run through the content of the agreement, um, slightly more abbreviated than we have in the past. Um, starting with um, the recognition that um, what we're working on here today is not uh, an establishment of any new tribal rights and has no effect on tribal rights. Um, those are established federally and through the courts. What we're doing here today is um, voluntary and based on existing authority for the Fish and Wildlife Commission. 
And um, there's two layers of that authority. Um, there's expansive authority for the Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, over fishing, hunting, gathering um, within existing state laws. Um, and this includes determining the time, place, and manner in which wildlife may be harvested, as well as the amounts of wildlife harvest and issuing permits for that harvest. So the agreement that we're, we're presenting today extends some of that authority to partnership with the tribal government. Uh, and the second piece uh, is the authority to enter into agreements um, with any person, including tribal governments, uh, for the development and encouragement of wildlife research and management programs and projects. Um, and as you've heard, there's great interest from the tribe in those kinds of programs and projects for the benefit of fish and wildlife and the geography we're talking about. Um, so I'll start with uh, the geographic scope of the agreement. Um, uh, uh, this is uh, the tribe's federal service area, which follows the model that we, you've seen for the Coquel agreement and the agreement with the Couch Creek tribe from December. Um, and uh, as Chair Nieper mentioned, there's been interest from the tribe in doing this kind of agreement with the department um, for a while now, but they had uh, to move through some internal process before they were allowed to talk to us, really, <laughs> because their, their constitution cares so deeply about fish and wildlife wildlife and harvest opportunities that it's written in that um, the whole membership needs to agree in order to take this kind of step. And so um, we started uh, our discussion in December after that vote had happened. And, and I'll just say from staff perspective, we were, we were blown away when we heard the results of the vote with only one person in the whole community that uh, did not want this to happen. Um, uh, so uh, we've been working on this since December. Um, and like I said, it is um, substantially the same as the other agreements. Um, so the geographic scope is this five county federal service area. Like I said, it follows that same agreement. That's Lincoln, Lane, Douglas, Coos, and Curry counties, and the near shore marine areas, which goes out to three miles offshore. Um, the federal service area is actually somewhat irrelevant to the department. <laughs> it is a federal, uh, a federal designation of where uh, the majority of the tribal members live, as the chair mentioned. Um, and it's really a boundary of convenience. Um, and and um, is helpful to see on the map and is relevant in terms of where other services are provided to tribal members. And so it's relevant for the service of hunting and fishing licensure to be in that same geography. Um, there's other provisions related to geographic scope. The first being that um, in order to uh, participate in harvest on private lands, it has to be with the landowner's permission, which is the case for, for state harvest as well. Um, and that uh, tribal rules and regulations um, will follow the same rules and regulations for ODF and W owned and managed lands. An example of that would be on our wildlife management areas. If there's restrictions on trapping or restrictions on um, method of take that tribal members participating in a tribal season, but on ODFW land would follow the, the ODF of W regulations in that case. Um, but we do have a, a clause that allows for an exception on an annual basis if that becomes relevant um, to the tribe. And also, I think at this point, it, it's clear as this is our third agreement with a similar geography that these are non-exclusive and we're excited about the opportunity for the, the three tribes now to be working together um, for the collective uplift of fish and wildlife in, in their overlapping counties. Uh, so I'll go next to um, section four of the agreement, um, which is the critical policy statement that the parties will coordinate on our respective authorities, uh, resources and influence uh, on our shared priorities for fish, wildlife and habitat. As Chair Nieper mentioned, there's already ongoing habitat projects led by the tribe. And um, as all of these federal opportunities play out over an, the next two and a half years, we're particularly excited about partnerships um, to apply for funding that the states can access and apply for different funds that the tribes can access and try to put those next to each other and be complementary in the work that we're doing on shared priorities. Uh, so the intent of this section is that the state and the tribe will have an annual meeting to discuss opportunities, um, plans for fish and wildlife management and conservation in the, the shared geography. Uh, and then from there, that will coordinate on the opportunities that we do find in those conversations and um, throughout the year. Uh, we've also committed to sharing relevant data and information for any of those projects or opportunities related to fish and wildlife management. 
Uh, so section three of the agreement outlines how tribal members would be able to harvest natural resources under the terms of the agreement. And really the intent of this section is to increase opportunities for tribal members to harvest fish and wildlife consistent with tribal values rather than consistent with state values, which is the case under a state fish and wildlife license. Um, and I think that's an important point to, to make because that's the point <laughs> of, the, of this agreement is that opportunities for tribal members may and will be different than opportunities for non-tribal members in this geography. Um, and that's a policy statement of this agreement. Uh, many members of the tribe already participate in hunting, fishing, and trapping by purchasing a license from the department, and Chair Nieper included. And I, I assume as an OSP officer and a, a, a tribal officer, he was following the law and acquiring those licenses. Uh, so we, we expect yes. that the result of this section, uh, there will be a shift where tribal members who already participate will begin participating under a tribal framework instead of a state framework. Um, so we really don't anticipate a large increase of harvest um, participation, but rather a shift in, in the, um, the licensing behind that participation. Uh, so the proposal applies to all of the wildlife that the Department of Fish and Wildlife has the authority to manage, including thin fish, land prey, shellfish, crustaceans, mammals, and birds. Um, and then I think it's really important to highlight that this is uh, all about ceremonial and subsistence harvest. It does not authorize the tribe to implement commercial opportunities, um, but it is likely to result in different bag limits for tribal members, as I mentioned before. Um, subsistence harvest is different than recreational harvest because it truly is about feeding the community. Um, I'll move on to limits and areas. Oh, I've got a slide ahead of myself, sorry. Uh, the agreement lays out a framework where we'll have an annual meeting um, between the department and the tribe uh, at which the tribe will present a list of species and their proposed limits and areas for the next year. Um, the limits and areas will vary between species um, depending on the interest of tribal members and conservation concerns that there might be. Uh, there are some species where the department has low concern for population levels, and it'll be easy to reach mutual consent on the limits and areas. And there will be those species where we do have conservation concerns or limits in place for, for non-tribal members, and we'll, we'll bring that to the table as we pursue mutual consent on a, a sustainable harvest level. Uh, in those annual meetings, the department staff is guided by our existing plans and policies for what's an acceptable level of harvest. Uh, for example, the Rogue South Coast Multi-Species Conservation and Management Plan or the Black Bear Management Plan uh, would guide our staff in what they bring to those conversations. Uh, if mutual consent cannot be achieved, there's a dispute resolution clause uh, that would allow both parties to go to mediation if we can't agree on limits for any particular species within the geography. And then if we cannot agree past that, um, there is the ability to terminate the agreement. Um, so there's strong incentive for both parties to work together and um, reach that solution. Once the limits and areas for every species are identified, the department will issue an annual implementing permit consisting of the agreement, um, which will be incorporated into tribal licenses and tags. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Once the department and tribe have come to mutual agreement on species limits and areas, um, the tribe will determine the method and timing of ceremonial uh, or subsistence opportunities for enrolled members. So this could result in uh, a season that's slightly different than the state season in terms of time or uh, weapons uh, that may be used. Uh, the tribal issue, the relevant permits, licenses, or tags to their members to participate in these harvest opportunities, and the department will require reporting. Um, so we have a full accounting of, of the species, uh, the, the number of animals that are harvested in each of the species types. Um, so we can compare to the limits we set and adaptively manage into the future. Uh, the tribe will also be following all of Oregon revised statutes um, that are relevant to this. Uh, the department only has the authority to extend um, the, the authority that it has. Uh, so some of those statutes that, for example, um, sh not shooting from a moving vehicle um, would be uh, relevant to tribal members as well. Um, the tribe will adopt that into tribal code along with their regulations. Uh, there's also a commitment that tribal members will be required to carry tribal identification 
and any permits and licenses that are issued and present those to law enforcement when requested, whether that's Oregon State Police or um, the, the tribe's enforcement officers. Okay, so moving towards the end of the agreement, um, we have a summary of the dispute resolution provisions um, with the principles and intent of that process. Uh, the next provision is an aspirational goal related to uh, law enforcement and prosecution. Uh, it's uh, our intent that someday uh, a member of the tribe who is cited by Oregon State Police for violating the tribe's Fish and Wildlife Codes could be cited into tribal court. Um, but that process will go through district attorneys and the state police and a variety of other partners who aren't party to this agreement. So it's our statement that we would like to get to that point in the future. Um, the next piece I wanna highlight is um, equity and cooperative management agreements. Uh, if adopted today, this would be our third uh, cooperative management agreement. And I think it's been really valuable to have these be consistent. And so if there's another opportunity in the future that we would seek to apply that to all the tribes participating. Um, finally, our intent is that it's a, a perpetual agreement that's really defining the relationship between the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the tribe uh, for the long term. And so uh, it will become effective, uh, assuming the commission approves the administrative rules to implement it um, and will remain effective until a future commission uh, revokes those rules um, or the agreement is terminated by either of the parties. Uh, we also have a provision in here about um, available funding and continued authority, which um, is important because we're using the commission's authority uh, to, to make these agreements. And should the commission's authority change in the future, we, we need the ability to, to make that change in the agreement. Um, that's a general summary of uh, the provisions of the agreement. Um, I wanted to just uh, mention we have an addendum uh, in your packet, and it's a change to the recitals uh, that reference the 1855 treaty. And the modification is just a slight revision that um, makes it more historically accurate that that treaty was never ratified. Say that again, will you, the, just the last part. So there's the whereas in the recitals um, that references the 1855 treaty and the addendum is a modification to that language makes it more historically accurate because that treaty was never ratified and we hadn't referenced that in the original draft. Um, so if approved, um, the department will work with the, the tribes uh, on uh, getting it signed and then kicking off with uh, our local staff and the state police um, to talk about planning our annual meetings um, and receiving the first um, draft of the tribe's um, proposed species limits and areas. Um, and then having ongoing annual meetings to um, cooperate on management. I'll also note that we have a provision in all three of the Southwest Oregon agreements that says the tribes will coordinate with each other voluntarily. And so we expect that the Confederate tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla Indians will be convening with the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians and the Coquille Indian Tribe uh, annually to talk about um, the, the intent uh, of, for the opportunities for their members and um, working all together in the region. Thank you. Uh, so our staff report or staff recommendation today is to adopt the um, administrative rules uh, and implement this cooperative management agreement between the state and the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Seisla Indians. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like we already have questions and comments, which isn't a big surprise, but let's start with those. Commissioner Labhart. Okay, thank you, Chair Wall. So you answered my, you did a very good job of answering my question. So I just wanted to make sure that you have seen uh, on page two, addendum one, exhibit G, that did the whereas. You have seen that and have con concurred with that. Correct. We, okay. we work together on, on that change. Just wanted to make sure of that. The only thing else that Davia didn't cover, at least what I wanted to cover, was um, to make sure that um, this, this agreement results in a negligible reduction in revenue and negligible change in the impact of hunting and fishing in existing fish and wildlife populations, correct? So, yes. Yeah. And then um, I want to just, you know, this is the big deal. 
is a big deal for the tribe. It was a big deal for the other two tribes, and I don't want to lessen it by, you know, not saying that from you. It's it's I'm proud to be here today to enter into this agreement with your tribe, and uh, I'm looking forward to voting yes. Thank you. Thank you. And Commissioner, just so you know, we will have the time for questions, and then we have people who would like to testify, just a couple, and then we'll come back to the vote. So, oh, okay. Vice Chair Zarnowitz. Yeah, I just have um, one question, <clears throat> and uh, and I think you covered everything, and, and it uh, corresponds with what I read. The, the one thing that um, you said was in one of those slides, that uh, um, sorry, staff report or staff recommendation the today timing to adopt the, the um, administrative would, rules um, uh, and implement timing this cooperative their own timing agreement of between hunts. the state and the confederate And how would that correspond with uh, the state's main timing of And it looks like so we already have questions and comments for the same time. Time. But let's start uh, Chair with Wall, Vice Chair Zarnowitz, uh, um, the timing we we will be leaving to the tribe. So I will invite them to provide comment on that. But uh, um, page two, we expect one, the subsistence harvest will be similar to the state's timing, maybe a few days different, a few weeks we, different. We um, and that ceremonial that. harvest could happen sure throughout the year as relevant. Um, but then I'll turn over to the chair if they have expertise. Um, yeah, we have not set that yet because we're going to look at everything. We don't want it to impact the wildlife populations. We don't want to set seasons are going to interfere with you know, with this is a big deal. the population a big you know deal for the tribe it's a big deal for the other two we don't, tribes we want to make sure that there's a, by, you know, the, the that least impact we can it's, have it's, on the population so to be here today, um, we're not going to do some wild outlandish tribe, you know 12 month season or yes. or something like that but you know we're going to take a look at what what the best practice would be and that's what we're going to base it on and we it won't be a a secret we're going to work with the other tribes and with the state yeah, have, uh, on those um, issues as well. And, um, and I think you covered. I did have a couple of questions. And, I want to go back, if, uh, if I could, Daria, first to you and then to you, um, the chair. That, um, the consistency has been something we've talked about in each one of these. And in this that, one, it's um, basically the same as timing. I mean, there are obvious differences because the tribes are so different, but the, the essentially it's the same. Or are there differences that we should be thinking about? Uh, chair wall it is the same okay um, thank you it, it makes so much sense to have it the other question i have is for you chair um the resources that you will be co-managing um, and have been paying attention to for so long used to be more plentiful and you talk about i think um, enhancing your work on some of the habitat side would you talk a little more about that and what that would look like and then i have one other question related to that as far as uh, like the, the projects that we've already been working on yeah and i think what you said was that you, this will enhance that that your, your work will be enhanced. So is that a focus area? What, I'm just curious if you could say more about that. I think it would expand our focus areas. Um, you know, right now we have only so many funds to, to, to do these the projects, but we look to pro uh, partner with, you know, with other um, entities to do these projects and we apply for grants. Um, and um, frankly, we have look at grants available that, to the um, state would not. And so that, that's what our, our population our focus said, would be is to protect um, those species. Those are the the salmon, with salmon, as we know, is really in bad shape. So we don't, we're not going to have a huge salmon harvest or attempt to have a salmon harvest because we're going to protect those species. But, you know, it's kind of a, it's hard to say specifically because you know we're going we're to look at everything that we can and as much as our staff level will permit it um, as i said we're expanding our department of natural resources we have specialists right now that work on a lot of different projects but we're going to expand those capabilities and we're continually doing that um, we're right now in the process of hiring a, do, a new uh, director for that department and so 
Uh, I should say this right now, but we're getting ready to make an offer uh, to a gentleman we just interviewed yesterday, and he has a wide uh, area of expertise that we're going to, I think, benefit from really uh, greatly. The other question I have, and I think it's first to you, Chair Nicker, and then maybe also you, Davia, but... The talk about the, the three Southwest tribes working together on some of these issues, has this actually helped that process or is that something that was already going on for years and years and it's just another aspect? On the staff level, a lot of the tribes I know uh, our uh, DNR um, staff work with the Coquel on different projects. Um, this would um, give us enough, another opportunity to work with these other other tribes that are, you know, uh, Salets, Cow Creek, you know, Grand Ronde, uh, Kirkwell, um, on a higher level, um, you know, a higher staff level, you know, not just the people working in the field, but work on official and, and uh, agreements that, 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 you know, benefit all of us yeah, and, you know, right and now, the state as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, it, it'll be a higher level of uh, cooperation and, and, and agreements and, these and, and working together than I think we probably do right now. Could I have one point on the list? Other, if, uh, if I could just add, there, and, and this is these projects very much in the beginning of the discussions, but there's been discussion amongst uh, some of the tribes about a side agreement to help the tribes implement this. So that we are talking um, and we have good information as we're interacting with the state to implement this agreement. Collectively. That wasn't going on before this whole process Correct. that you've been going through. Correct. Um, then if you three will not leave the room, but if we can let the people who would like to testify come up, we will thank you and then we'll ask you to come back up. So thank you. Um, then we first have the Chairwoman Cheryl Kennedy who would like to speak and then we have Ronald Beers from Mapleton who just might be the grand nephew of somebody who just spoke. <laughs> Um, as I said, we're expanding our Department of Natural Resources. We have specialists right now that work on a lot of different projects. Welcome, Chair. We're going to expand Thank you. those capabilities. And we're I was wondering what this was. Doing that. Uh, 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 well, thank right you again for hearing, hearing me, and uh, I just want to say and, so, and express uh, from the Confederate <coughs> I got some I shouldn't say this right now, but candy in my mouth, but um, from the Confederated Tribes Grand Rod that we support the MOU between um, the state and the two tribes that are presenting here today. I, it's, uh, it's a very worthy um, cause for all tribes to be treated in the same way, even though we're... But I hear you that we that we will be on the agenda for the next meeting and appreciate that. But I think it's a wonderful, glorious day for the two tribes that are here today. So my hands are raised to you. I am Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, our, uh, DNR, so, um, Go ahead. Um, um, I'm going to be reading off of what I wrote. Okay. Hello, my name is Ramil. I am a Sayu Swan native uh, of Lauren Cooper person. Uh, person from Sayu Swan territory. Pretty termination uh, Sayu Swan our tribe has lack of lifelong fishing permits from the Coquille Indian Reservation. But after we got terminated, in order for our tribe to be restored, we had to leave that behind. And now we have to get our permits from people other than our own tribe. Our tribe has lack of lifelong fishing permits from the Coquille Indian Reservation. And now we have to get our permits from people other than our own tribe. I'd much rather get my permits from my tribe in our territory where I know the money pays. We go to restoration projects, native plant restoration, and much more. Our tribe also practices a ceremony called salmon ceremony. The salmon ceremony is when the first salmon is caught, everyone stops fishing and celebrates the first catch of the run. Because we waited after catching the first fish, the, this allowed the salmon to have a chance to travel upstream and spawn. Um, 
Not only that, but after salmon ceremony, our tribe would look at the salmon numbers before continuing to fish so we could keep the fish numbers high. After salmon ceremony, we would also return the salmon's remains to the water to respect the salmon people and to invite them to come back time after time. Two years ago, salmon numbers were dangerously low, and as a native person, I decided not to fish the entire year because I knew that I needed to let the salmon spawn so that they will continue to come back and let the numbers raise. I also knew the salmon were suffering because pe even though people knew the numbers were low, they continued to fish. As a native youth, fishing is very important to me. I've been fishing my entire life, and I love it. To me, fishing is a way to not only get my own food, but also a teaching moment. I've helped teach friends how to fish, and one of my greatest memories is helping my little sister fish. Fishing has been part of the tribal culture from the very beginning, and we have self-regulated our own fishing from that same time. I want to be able to continue to teach people how to fish in native ways. I also think as a youth, it is important to continue teaching fish, fishing, and other traditional methods to youth so that our control culture continues to pass on and become stronger so that Native youth don't have to question if they really belong in their own land. Kisa, thank you. Thank you. Well said. Um, I will, before we... Um, we have Brian McLaughlin online. Um, thank you again for. Okay. Oh, I was looking at the wrong list. Sorry, Brian McLaughlin, go ahead, and then we'll go back to comments. Express from the Confederate. Brian, can you hear me? I should say this. We can now. Yes. Commissioner's Director Melcher, my name is Brian McLaughlin. I live in Fort Norton. Reconciling God, yes, historical yes, injustices yes, and mistreatment yes, of Native Americans and tribes with the realities of today is a daunting challenge. The world and our state has changed uh, profoundly the since the 1850s and, and indeed, the two tribes that even are since the 1950s. Presenting there are over 4.2 million human rights, beings uh, in now called Oregon in their home. While we have ancestries from all over the globe, uh, there are millions of people were born right here, tribes, and there are more on the way. Hundreds of, and thousands of us, of all races, way, ethnicities, and ancestors, deeply value the forest, fish, and wildlife and the experience of hunting and fishing. For many of us, this experience is not just a recreational pastime, but a way of life. And it deeply enriches our lives. It's part of our personal community identities, our social structure, our family bonds, the way we plan our seasonal activities, and the food we provide to our families. It's a heritage passed down from parents and grandparents and a heritage we hope to pass on to our children. Fishing and hunting also supports livelihoods, jobs, careers, and community economies. These activities, along with the fish and wildlife themselves, and of course the lands and waters that support the fish and wildlife, and all the reasons all of us, profoundly shape this commission has a fiduciary name to act in the best interest of all citizens of Oregon. Finding an equitable path to fulfill that duty, given present realities, can be very challenging. ODFW, on behalf of the state of Oregon, has expressed the representative that as a result of the proposed MOA, the public will be likely minimally affected that overall hunting and fishing activities by tribal members are not anticipated to increase. That business, which provide goods and services to hunters and anglers, are not expected to be impacted. And that only small reductions in the public's fishing and hunting opportunities are expected to result in the accommodating tribal fishing and hunting activities. These are extremely important. Ceremony, and I believe I've said the same there is extremely important to the recreation of hunting and fishing community at large. I wish they were memorial to the young ways themselves, as has been requested. Unfortunately, they are not. And in this view, in this way, I think there's a major flaw in the agreements. Because a well-drafted agreement should reflect and memorialize that, the end of the party. Ceremony, where the representation is expressly included, and where the terms so of the MOA is to adequately support these representations, I would have no material concerns with the MOA. Nonetheless, I am relying on these representations to be truthful and accurate, and that ODFW will adhere to them in negotiating and agreeing to annual tribal harvest levels, as has been represented to me by the well, WFW staff. As a native person, I decided not to go the entire year. Proposed rulemaking and now brought up here today. I trust the tribe are not only aware of them, but also sharing those expectations as well. 
So thank you for letting the numbers raise. I also knew the salmon were suffering. Thank you, Brian. Um, Commissioner, questions of Brian. Well, they continue to fish. There aren't any yet, Brian. So let's go to asking our first panel to come back up. And if we have any other questions or comments, we can make them now. And then we can go to a vote. I've helped teach friends. Commissioner King. And one Thank of my you, Chair Wall. Is helping my little uh, sister yeah, fish. Just the, I, I guess it's just an overall comment. Part of I think these sorts of things are important because it, it reflects that there are many stewards to the land. Um, so there are many ways um, to achieve the, the goal that helps us all, which is, you know, restoring so many important habitats. And the, the hearing about the first salmon ceremony reminded me, I read uh, Robin Kimmerer's book, um, Braiding Sweetgrass. And where she talks about that and talks about how purposely you caught one and let all the rest go by and, and kind of coming more to just um, a, a much more indigenous way of thinking, which is instead of the scarcity mindset, but the abundance one and how so many people can learn from that indigenous or not. Um, and so hearing more of that voice in the natural resources space, I think is really very important. Um, and I think that's why these sorts of agreements are important because it, as, it, and it, as you stated, even on a monetary level, you guys are now eligible for things that we are not as a state. And so that the, it, it, it helps kind of one of my goals, which is, you know, instead of talking about the 80, let's talk about the 420. Like, like it helps us pivot and move and look at it in a more holistic way. So um, I look forward to more of these. I guess we have nine federally recognized tribe. I guess we'll eventually have nine agreements. So um, yeah, congratulations to you all. I would just like to add, um, these are deeply important to us, which must be just a dim reflection of how important they are to the tribes um, and to you who are before us. Um, so just wanted to put that and make that comment. And it's, it's, it's just deeply important to us to hear these and have this be happening. So um, who would like to be the one making the motion on this? The sugar card is up. <laughs> Go ahead, I just, I don't, I, I think Commissioner Laphart might want to make this motion. Is that what you're saying? But I wanted to make some comments just to say that each one of these agreements is just so deeply important. And, um, you know, I want to acknowledge that we're not doing the Grand Bond Agreement today. And that creates just a sadness for me too, that, that, that um, and I appreciate their chair just jumping in and supporting supporting you guys. And that's really uh, when you're talking about uh, the, the fact that now the tribes might coordinate with one another. And um, it's kind of what it, that's about, right? That's kind of what it's all about is that we all, all boats rise, you know, we all work together to try to take really good care of this resource. So, so these agreements are special and I hope, Chair Wallet, after we make the motion, we can have that five minutes of just mingling with the folks to just do that hand on hand. Uh, just appreciation of that this is, a, these are big deal, these agreements, I think, and they heal all of us. Thank you. Commissioner Lavar. Yes, I would be honored to make this motion. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I move to approve the draft memorandum of agreement attachment three and adopt the new OAR 635-80050 as proposed by staff and shown in attachment four. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the draft memorandum of agreement in attachment three as read into the record. And we will do a roll call on this one, please, Michelle. Spellbring? Yes. Hatfield High. Yes. King. Yes. Lapart. Yes. Sarnowitz. Yes. Wall. Yes. Five minute break, and then we will do another one. Thank you.
I have it here and here. It was different than this one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> another motion. I I you want to make this one? Another motion. motion. Another motion. We got to redo it. Oh, good. The one on here wasn't I correct, and the one on ours wasn't correct. Okay. okay. To say that it's, it's just to yeah. represent. Yeah. 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 Y
Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm extra super excited to be bringing this exhibit to you today as we've been working with the Celettes um, for about two years on this agreement. Um, uh, Chair Pigsley and Craig will be covering the tribe's history and their interest in the work with the department. Um, but I, I really do want to say that growing our partnership with the Celettes is a pathway to improve outcomes for fish and wildlife in Oregon and enhance tribal sovereignty. That, that's really important to the state. Um, the agreement we're going to talk about today is extremely similar to the agreement I presented to you over the last year, um, but its origins are slightly different. Um, the Select Tribe re uh, reached out to Governor Brown um, and asked to work with the department. Uh, in early 2021, um, around the same time, uh, there's uh, legislation uh, to revoke the consent decree related to Celeste's um, hunting and fishing rights. Um, so this really began with initial request to be proactive and prepare for um, when Congress eventually takes that action. Um, in the process of developing the agreement, we realized we have the ability and the authority to do this anyway and do this as a voluntary action as a partnership between the state and the tribe. And we've really moved beyond reference to the consent decree in this work. Um, and we have added to the agreement um, an explicit statement that this agreement is not a successor to the consent decree because we're doing it now voluntarily. And should that legislation pass, uh, we will um, have a different negotiation between the state and the tribe. So I just wanted to start off by saying that this agreement is different for those reasons, but it is very, very, very similar. And uh, uh, despite it being separate negotiations, we landed in a very parallel place to the other agreements that you've seen. So um, since we've just presented a very similar agreement, I'll really focus on um, the areas where this one is, is slightly different. Um, but we'll start with Chair Pigley um, and her presentation. We have a slide presentation for you. Okay, the slides, um, it takes about 10 minutes to get through them, but we'll do this. Um, the tribe is, uh, is made up of many, many tribes, more than we could ever list, but it's the Clats of the Chinook, the Klickitat, Malala, Kalapuya, Tillamook Bands and Tribes, Rogue River, River Alsea, Lower Umpqua, Coos, Coquel, Upper Umpqua. And as you can tell, it's uh, legislation or a treaty that happened that uh, the original idea was to move everyone to the reservation in Celeste in 1855. And the governor, the government has not been um, the best two tribes, as, as you can tell. Uh, we all got mixed up on many reservations, uh, different places, and were actually moved to the coast reservation. So it serves as a, a homeland for tribes with many different languages, and activities, and um, cultural differences. The relocation uh, occurred. Let's see, are you using? Okay, the relocation occurred um, along with several treaties that began at the Rogue River and ended up for us, ended up in Salette's reservation. Originally was 1,100 1, acres along the Oregon coast. And the Salette's tribe today. Um, resides on, on the Oregon coast. It was in 1954 that our tribe was terminated by the federal government. And as a result, we're without any um, tribal identification for over 20 years. And it was in 1977 when the tribe was restored after termination. And I originally served on that restoration council beginning back in 1975. So that makes me kind of old. <laughs> Been around a while, but what it did to us, uh, the restoration of the tribe, was um, we were told we would not be restored unless we signed an agreement, signed away any hunting and fishing rights we had. And we worked very hard to try to overcome that, but it became law in, in one of our um, uh, the Restoration Act, and two years later it was to be a part of the reservation plan. And according to what we were told, if you don't agree, uh, you will not have a reservation. So at the time, it 
was what we had to do in order to uh, become a tribe with, with a small land base. And today there's about 5,600 members. We have an 11 county service area with offices in Portland, Salem, Eugene, Springfield. We have a constitution, a nine member tribal council, and we've worked very hard at trying to protect our natural resources through our natural resource department, which is not funded real well. Um, we're a self-governance tribe with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and through our efforts uh, as a self-governance tribe, we've tried to revive our natural resources and our cultural rights, and it's been difficult without any kinds of funds or funding from the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We have worked with the state to manage some resources. We've had um, many grants to look at enhancing uh, eels along the Celeste and some of the uh, creeks off the Celeste River. We have a fish hatchery where we just grow fish and release them. We don't have money actually to operate the hatchery. We've been doing that with grants. Uh, we have several um, agreements with the state to manage our natural resources, co-manage natural resources. Part of the ugly history of the Celeste tribe, uh, when it was terminated, not just losing our identity as Indians, because we were still Indian, we were still brown, we still looked like Indians, was the fact that we had many people who lived off salmon and eels and clams and anything that we could gather, roots gathered from the forest. All of that came to a halt once the tribe was terminated. And so with this agreement, those things would be revived. The subsistence uh, would be wonderful for our tribal members and the ceremonial salmon. Currently we're having our um, solstice dances this weekend. It's three nights of dancing and we have to go out and buy the salmon and buy whatever those things are that we feed people. And it would be wonderful to be able to have our own folks go out and catch salmon for this particular ceremony. And it would also be wonderful in order to do that for things like weddings and funerals and all of the activities that we have going on in the tribe. We've worked very hard with the paper state, with ODF&W, long meetings, many, many drafts of actions that um, we can take, the tribe can take. We're very interested in being meaningful partners in protecting the resources. And we know the resources are at risk. We know that we can do our share. Our tribe has always been a protector of those resources that um, are so dear to people in Oregon. We have hunters that have never experienced hunting for the tribe for subsistence or for ceremonial. Uh, I brought with me today Ed Ben, who is our oldest tribal member that can tell stories about um, going out and hunting and fishing for families that didn't have food, didn't have whatever put on the table. And he's here today to listen. I asked him if he wanted to talk, and he said no. <laughs> and he's in the back of the room, and he uh, uh, has a lot of stories to tell about how things used to be, and we know things will never be the same as they were 70 years ago, 40 years ago. But we want to be part of whatever it is that 
uh, we can do to preserve those resources well, to support our families. And actually, this is probably one of the biggest and most meaningful things that we can do for our tribe is to uh, have this agreement and be able to enter into uh, all of the activities that we planned with ODS and W. And I have to say that uh, Governor Brown was very instrumental in telling us you need to go forward and we need to support all of the Oregon tribes in, in, in these kind of agreements. And so I'm just saying it's probably as meaningful as restoration itself. So you mentioned this is a big deal. It is a huge big deal. So thank you. Dr. Melcher, members of the commission. For the record, my name is Davia Palmieri. Thank you, Chair Pigsley. I think probably shouldn't have me speak after you. Um, it's wonderful. I'm so happy to be a part of this. Um, because the agreement is, is quite similar, I'll go a little faster. Uh, but uh, reviewing the commission's authority to enter the agreements, I think um, as we've referenced, the consent decree is there, but we actually have case law that um, tells us we have the authority to, to enter into this agreement uh, that goes above uh, and beyond so what's in the consent decree. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm extra super excited to be bringing this exhibit to you today. And having the work with the Solettes um, <laughs> for about two years in this agreement. Um, um, so uh, uh, we will, Chair and Craig will be covering the tribe's history. Let's start with the geographic the scope of the agreement. Um, um, the, uh, uh, it includes four wildlife management units um, along the coast. Um, this uh, generally follows the original coast reservation boundary as described by the tribe. Um, and we've sort of generalized it out to biologically relevant areas, which are our wildlife management units. Uh, many of those have obvious and distinguishable features on the landscapes, like roads, um, that help people know which unit they're in. Um, so we've gone with that as a, a relevant um, boundary for the agreement. Um, as with the other agreements, um, any harvest on private lands must be with the private landowner's permission. Um, there's a, explicit exclusions from this area for the Grand Ronde Reservation, property held in trust, for any other federally recognized tribe, um, as well as the Columbia and Willamette Rivers um, from the mouth to Willamette Falls. Um, and again, this is non-exclusive, um, and uh, the agreement with the, the Kuzlan Frasayusla actually does have an overlap here in, in Lincoln County with this geographic scope. We have added to the agreement um, so the next section is our cooperative is management section, which is again a, a policy statement um, that I should perfectly uh, summarize well, that it's a commitment that we have these shared priorities for the natural resources in this area and that we intend to work together to identify um, what we can do um, to uplift those shared fish and resources together, um, to meet annually to discuss those opportunities, um, to coordinate on funding opportunities um, and other management, as well as sharing information that we may have that will help the other parties. Uh, so uh, going to the sections that govern um, harvest, um, the intent here is to increase opportunities for tribal members to harvest fish and wildlife resources consistent with tribal values. Um, and it applies to all of the animal species over which ODFW exercises management, um, and that's mammals, birds, fin fish, shellfish, crustaceans, uh, eels, as, as Chair Pigley said, that, that we tend to call lamprey at the department, but the same very important species um, to both of our organizations. Um, so the harvest uh, is ceremonial and subsistence harvest opportunities. Um, and uh, I, I want to highlight here that we've included some um, opportunities for uh, commercial activity. And I want to thank Vice Chairman Bud Lane for, um, for having a deep knowledge of the types of products um, that members might be interested in producing and selling um, from what can be made from hides and even autolifts of fish, um, and that these are opportunities from the, the results of ceremonial and subsistence harvest, so clamshells that were um, gathered as part of subsistence, um, that those shells could then be made into to products for sale um, as a, a level of commercial opportunity. 
relocate. The relocation occurred um, along with several. Um, and so uh, our process for determining the limits and areas of harvest every year is, is a little bit different um, than the day agreement we just heard in that our intent is to uh, have our very first meeting and have the tribe present us a list of the species of interest for harvest. Um, and that uh, at that time, we'll review all of those species and identify those for which the department believes limits um, are, are critical um, and that we will negotiate on those limits um, and carry those forward and renegotiate them every year, um, generally assuming we'll, we'll be static unless there is a change uh, in the conservation status or other management goals um, that may arise. Um, from there, when we have mutual consent, uh, we will uh, we have dispute resolution provisions that could eventually lead to termination if we can't reach that mutual consent. Um, but assuming that we do, we will have a, an annual implementing permit as part of this agreement as well. Um, the tribe will determine the method and timing of those harvest opportunities to make them culturally, culturally relevant to things like the ceremony that you heard about. Um, the tribe will generate their own rules, um, including um, the relevant Oregon revised statutes um, that uh, all Oregonians have to follow uh, related to safety. Uh, the tribe will issue licenses and tags um, or the relevant information and gather data and share with ODFNW on harvest rates and success. Um, a, a key difference um, between some of the other management agreements and, and this one here relates to the special areas um, where uh, it's really important as a coastal entity um, to have access for coastal gathering in particular. Um, the state has a series of uh, special marine areas that you heard about yesterday on the tour, like marine gardens and research reserves. Um, and this agreement explicitly allows uh, members of the Silets to uh, exercise their, their harvest um, in those areas. Um, you heard yesterday as well that there are new areas that have been identified in the territorial sea plan. Uh, when those areas were identified, Governor Brown provided direction that she did not intend for those to affect tribal opportunities. Um, and so by adopting this provision, um, we are extending that to the existing marine gardens in particular as well. It does not apply to the marine reserves and the marine protected areas, which are in statute. Um, and so those, those remain closed. Uh, in the terrestrial environment, um, the tribe is agreeing to uh, follow ODFNW rules on ODFNW owned and managed lands. Um, for example, a wildlife management area, a tribal member with a tribal license or tag on ODFW land would follow the rules of ODFW land. Um, we've uh, outlined in the in the agreement that uh, we'll develop a communication plan to ensure that the Oregon State Police and other law enforcement are aware of the tribal regulations um, to ensure that we have consistent and, and safe enforcement uh, and reciprocity between the state and the tribe's enforcement. Um, we intend to seek prosecution referral agreements um, with the intent that um, someday with working with the district attorneys that a tribal member cited by the tribal police or Oregon State Police would be seen in tribal court. Um, and then we have included that same provision that uh, encourages the tribes to coordinate with each other before working with the department on our annual agreements. Uh, so the other provisions of the agreement um, are, are very similar um, where we have dispute resolution and mediation. Um, there is a special call out to the sharing of available carcasses. So within this geographic area, um, the department and the state police already do um, call the tribe when there's uh, roadkill, for example, or other um, confiscated wildlife. Um, and so we've got a commitment in the agreement to continue that and to provide a substantial share of what becomes available in this area with the tribe. Um, it also extends to um, uh, salmon carcasses. Um, we have equity and cooperative management agreements, which again um, relates back to changes to other agreements that we could adopt into this one in the future. 
Um, and again, we intend this to be a perpetual agreement. Um, we have the opportunity for unilater unilateral termination um, should either party desire to go that route. Um, but we do intend for it to um, be uh, establishing our relationship for the long term. Um, we have uh, we had this uh, exhibit notice for December of 2022, and we received public comment at that time. And we had an uh, addendum that we worked through, um, but there was uh, concern about overlap with the pending federal legislation uh, and the consent decree, which I did mention. And so we've added an explicit statement in this agreement that the parties agree this is not the successor to the consent decree. This is a voluntary agreement between both parties. Um, to plan for our future together. Um, and then uh, I mentioned that the, the tribe will be uh, following Oregon revised statutes and um, that we, we just clarified that language to make it really clear um, that that is the intent. Uh, so if adopted today, this will become effective through the adoption of administrative rules. Um, we'll intend to, to kick off a summit and have a list of species from, from the Silettes uh, in our hands so we can start talking about opportunities um, and adopting into tribal code and having our ongoing uh, meetings. And I will uh, conclude my comments there and turn it back to Chair Pigsley if there's anything else she wants to say. I just have to say that uh, in the United States, there's only two tribes in the whole United States that had to enter into a consent decree in order to be recognized once again as a tribe. And that's Salettes and Grand Round. Thank you. Thank you. All right, hi there. So I just wanted to clarify a couple points that uh, might help. So for example, Chair Wall, the first thing I wanted to address is you had a question to the last tribe um, about whether the tribes are cooperating in natural resources management. And the answer is they haven't done that a lot up to date because until these agreements, there's been no separate right or opportunity to exercise those harvest rights. They've been subject to state law. Sluts and Grand Ron have very limited extra rights. But with this agreement, what we've been talking about is establishing an intertribal consortium to formalize the coordination and consultation between the tribes that have entered into these agreements because the agreements talk about if there's overlap, the tribes will consult and coordinate with each other. And so we're working on establishing that mechanism uh, going forward. Um, the other thing, we have our natural resources director here if he needs to answer any questions. The Sluts Natural Resources Department has been focused more on timber harvesting, timber management, because the fish and wildlife rights have been fairly limited. We have exercised the ones we have, but we need to build up that organization and structure, which the tribe is including in its budget going forward. We've also already had some discussions with uh, people in DC about trying to increase the tribe's fish and wildlife funding uh, now that the rights would be sort of more recognized. And we hope to get some additional funding uh, going forward that we can add to the habitat restoration and other efforts. Um, we're coordinating as much as possible. There was a list in the slides about a number of the projects that we do that are ongoing, but uh, we hope to do more with some additional funding. Um, I wanted to emphasize, uh, the chairman talked about, so when Celeste was terminated in the 1950s, their tribal existence wasn't terminated. It's just the federal government stopped recognizing them as having a separate status. So the tribe continued to exist, continued to function. But the federal government recognized that that policy was a disaster. And so they started the policy of restoration. Um, Professor Charles Wilkinson at the University of Oregon was the sort of prime supporter and helper of that restoration effort uh, for Celeste. You may have heard he just passed away last week. So uh, this is kind of a culmination of what he was 
uh, trying to achieve. And the only thing I would say about it is, so when Sluts was restored as a tribe, a federally recognized tribe in 1977, so that overcame the trauma of termination. But then as part of restoration, the state imposed this new trauma of forcing the tribe to give up their hunting and fishing rights in order to get a reservation. And a reservation is critical for tribal status and jurisdiction. So that was a real Hobson's choice the tribe was forced into, get a reservation, give up fishing rights, or not get any land. So they had to make that choice. At the time, I think you'll hear from Vice Chair uh, Lane during the comment period, he actually showed up in federal court during the entry of the original consent decree and argued against it, but the tribal council had made that decision to go forward at that time. Um, so uh, the only other things I wanna say, uh, you heard a comment about uh, the marine gardens and uh, the research reserves. The tribe's position has always been, those weren't established for conservation reasons. They were established like for tourism or education. Uh, for example, in the research reserves, the whole intent was to return those areas to the baseline that they had been before non-Indians showed up. But that baseline was with thousands of years of tribal harvesting and management. So we said, you know, we should be part of that process uh, when you're studying those things. And the same thing with marine gardens, our agreement says, if we exercise rights in those areas, we do it in the least intrusive way that doesn't interfere with the current purposes. <laughs> but the tribe in its agreement was limited to Lincoln County which already is pretty limited. And then the state has since set aside over 40% of the county in these different areas. So, and the prime harvesting areas. So essentially the tribe was left without many areas to uh, exercise their gathering rights. Um, the last thing is just, um, you saw the geographic area we have, the tribe just decided to keep it to the original reservation boundary. Uh, we have not proposed at this time uh, the service area like other tribes have because we want the opportunity to ramp up our management capabilities um, and we'll see how that goes. Oh, and the last thing is the fed, you heard about the federal legislation. The reason we're pursuing that, Grand Ron is too, is uh, when the original agreement, 1980 agreement was entered into, it was also listed in the Tribes Reservation Act that that agreement was permanent and could never be questioned or challenged. So our legislation doesn't revoke the agreement. All it does is remove the reference to that agreement in federal legislation, which opens it up to renegotiation with ODFW going forward. But it, I just want to make sure it doesn't automatically revoke it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a final comment from me. I really want to thank Chair Pigsley and her team and, and Craig and his staff. As, as I mentioned, we've been working um, together for a little, probably about two years and um, really helped us uh, ponder some of the, the legal questions that we're bringing forward today and, and reach, um, reach a, a place where we really feel confident that this is um, the right thing to do. So our staff recommendation is to adopt the agreement and the, the administrative rules. Yep. Comments, questions? We do have some people who would like to testify, but let's take some yep. questions. Go ahead, Commissioner King. Thanks. Thank you, Chair Wall. Just a comment. I was just thinking <clears throat> when you mentioned how significant and how important these things are and that you really do need to take pause and acknowledge that because I, just thinking about a, a, a dear friend of mine, I'm from back east originally, and a dear friend of mine is Osage. Um, and like very much what you described, just kind of everybody got combined and they ended up in Oklahoma and you know, now they're just kind of this mixed bag of whatever. Um, but he also goes to the dances. Every year he sends me pictures of the dances. And it occurred to me every year, it's at the time of Juneteenth, meaning because it's always near the solstice, which is always near Juneteenth. And you know, and here we are now at Juneteenth and you know, you can kind of just sort of blow it off. It's like, yay, it's a three day holiday, but 
the significance of Juneteenth and that it is a holiday at all and that we can say it and that it is recognized and like what it actually means and that people, I've been to Juneteenth celebrations where people get up and actually read the Emancipation Proclamation and how significant that was and how they fought for their entire lifetimes to be able to do that. You do need to acknowledge that this is a big deal. So congratulations to you. Um, and I look forward to the yes vote. Anyone else right now? Then let's go ahead. We have several people and Chair Pixley, you were signed up. Shall I assume that you just testified or would you like to testify <laughs> just one more probably time? signed the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think one of the things we were meant to say is uh, we, we certainly supported the Coos agreement and we, we certainly support the Grand Ron tribe having an agreement also. So. Appreciate that. It's good. And uh, your clarification earlier was helpful. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, let's go to, uh, we have several people signed up. Um, Corrine Sams and Austin Smith first. And then we will go to Chair Nieper from the um, tribe. And we have two people on here with nearly the same name, Bud Lane and Buddy Lane. If there are two people, that's great. But there are. Okay. <laughs> My family's the same, so <laughs> let's go with Corrine Sams and Austin Smith first. Uh, can you hear me okay? Can you hear yes. me? Okay, yes. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Corrine Sams, and I'm an elected board of trustees member for the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, as well as the Fish and Wildlife Commission chair and vice chair of the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today in support of the proposed draft memorandum agreement between the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife that is here before you today. The Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation is one of nine federally recognized tribes in Oregon. Our ancestors having successfully negotiated a treaty in 1855 that was later ratified by the United States Congress in 1955, in which we reserved in the pre-existing rights to, among other things, hunt, fish, and gather our first foods. Our, in our area and interest of extensive use, and that includes the Columbia Basin and the Willamette River. Our tribal members harvest lamprey and salmon at Willamette Falls, conduct salmon fisheries below Bonneville Dam, and harvest smelt in the Sandy River. We have demonstrated this traditional use study, and we would welcome the opportunity to present that uh, study in the future to the, com to the commission. Pursuant to our treaty, our hunting, fishing, and gathering practices continue to this day and we strive for diplomacy and communication in pursuit of our first foods and in exercising of our treaty rights. The Siletz tribe reached out to the CTUIR and asked us what our concerns might be with a memorandum of agreement with the state regarding hunting and fishing, trapping and gathering in Oregon. And we told the Siletz about our concerns involving the potential interference with our treaty reserved rights at Willamette Falls and on the lower Columbia River. The Siletz took an approach that was very considerate of the CTUIR and other tribes. They excluded Willamette Falls and the lower Columbia below Bonneville Dam for the geographic scope of their agreement in response to the tribe's concerns. Furthermore, the Siletz tribe's draft agreement with ODFW offers a model for a future agreement between Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Round in a process that includes meaningful consultation between Siletz and other tribes, listening and responsive adjustments to propose geographical boundaries to minimize conflict or potential for conflict. And it is for this reason that the CTUIR supports the Siletz agreement going forward and we believe that the commission should approve the Siletz agreement. And I appreciate for uh, your time today for me to make these comments. And for the record, 
Um, I just want to say that the CTUIR disagreed with the majority of the comments that were made by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Round earlier this morning, and we will definitely be following up with the commission um, before the August meeting. So Katsiaya, thank you. Thank you, and I don't see questions at this point, so we will go on to Austin Smith, if we could. Hello, everyone. Um, commissioners, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. Um, my name is Austin Smith, Jr. I am an enrolled member of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs Reservation of Oregon. I am also the general manager of the tribe's branch of natural resources. I am here today to express support for the proposed memorandum agreement between ODFW and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. But before turning to the ODFW Siletz Tribe MOA, I want to briefly address the comments that I heard from the representatives of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron. While now is not the time for a formal response from my tribe, I simply want to note that CTWS disagrees with many of the statements that I heard and CTWS expressly reserves its right to provide further response to those statements as our tribal council deems appropriate. <clears throat> Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs is the legal successor and interest to the Indian signatories of the treaty with the tribes of Middle Oregon, dated June 25th, 1855, which reserves the sovereign right to the waters, lands, fish, and wildlife in the Pacific Northwest including the Columbia River Basin and its tributaries, such as the Willamette River. In our 1855 treaty, we reserved the right for our members to take fish at all usual and custom use areas, as our people have done since time immemorial. We also have treaty reserved rights to hunt and gather cultural foods throughout our Aboriginal lands. The water, fish, game, roots, and berries are integral components of our lives, longhouse ceremonies, and feasts. Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs supports the proposed ODFW Select Tribe MLA for the following reasons. First, CTWS appreciates a timely and meaningful consultation that the Select Tribe undertook with our tribe. The Select Tribe reached out to us to be sure that we understood its interest in seeking to enter into an agreement with ODFW and to understand any concerns that we may have had. Second, the Select Tribe recognizes and acknowledges we have off-reservation treaty reserved rights in the main stem Columbia River, below Bonneville Dam, and into Willamette River, including at Willamette Falls. To avoid the risk of intertribal conflict, the Select Tribe agreed to exclude those areas from the geographic scope of this agreement. Finally, we support the Select in ODFW Tribe MOA because we know that the Sledge Tribe will be good co-managers of the resources and the agreement will provide many opportunities for the Sledge Tribe and its membership. I urge you to approve the ODFW Sledge Tribe MOA and thank you for my time. Thank you, Austin. And there aren't questions, so we'll go right on to Chair Nieper. If you would like to come back up. And after that, um, Bud Lane and Buddy Lane. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say briefly that we fully support the Siletz Agreement. Um, and I think it's <clears throat> vitally important that all the tribes work together to resolve conflict and issues and support each other in these agreements because I think they're vitally important to all of us, uh, um, all the tribal members on and all the tribes. Um, so uh, uh, thank, you. thank you. We fully support all of those agreements. Thank you. Bud Lane and Buddy Lane, if you'd both like to come up. I'm old, but Dwayne. <laughs> <laughs> Even I figured out which was which. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for this hearing today. Um, I would just like to talk a little bit about and expand on some of the things that our tribal chairman mentioned about um, hunting and fishing and uh, uh, how it is culturally related to our belief systems that we have as Siletz Indians. 
Right now, as a matter of fact, we started last night with what we call um, the netash, and it mean, literally means the dance, and it's our people's way of uh, uh, thanking the creator for making the world, for making everything in it, and for making us. And uh, it's a, a significant um, cultural event and religious event in our tribe's lives, our tribal members' lives. And um, all of this surrounds um, uh, how foods were laid out for us, how, how the land and the waters were, and... Uh, um, one of the things that we've been unable to do for the many years uh, since termination is to go out and uh, harvest animals ceremonially for that for that purpose, for to take deer or to take fish. Uh, so when we do the celebration, that we have our first foods, and it's vitally important to us that we be able to do that, and that would come under a, a ceremonial uh, hunt or, or gathering. Um, one of the other things, too, that um, we had talked about uh, was it is our ancient tradition that uh, when the salmon run, that they run for nine days, and on the tenth day, the salmon run free. And I think that was mentioned a little bit earlier here today. Uh, and it's an important way that uh, people would conserve and, and maintain those numbers. And we have ancient dance prayers that actually speak to that, um, uh, to those actions. So um, uh, our people uh, were the first environmentalists. Um, we we were able to manage and use and live off those resources for thousands of years. And it's also directly related to our health. Uh, we all know, uh, as most Indian tribes do, that the, the biggest killer of Native Americans is diabetes and diabetes-related heart disease. And it's because of those changes in our diets over the recent generations that uh, is the main cause. And there is no silver bullet that will wipe those out, but um, uh, it is my hope and our people's hope that uh, this change and being able to access our first foods um, uh, in a more meaningful way will, will really help um, um, with that. And lastly, one of the things that we are also involved in uh, um, and, and assisting in is an organization called the Alaka Alliance. And the Alaka Alliance is about studying and the possibility of reintroducing the sea otters to the Oregon coast. Some of you may be aware of it, but um, as you may be aware also, uh, the sea otters are known as a keystone species that um, uh, the whole ecosystem depends on. The kelp forests that used to be out here on the coast, uh, which is largely gone now. And we're hoping that in the future that that can come to fruition and uh, those kelp forests be reestablished. And then finally, it's outside the state's um, um, uh, power, but uh, certainly could be a part of an international effort to try to halt, halt global, global warming that is happening and the acidification of the Pacific that is uh, uh, affecting all of our shellfish and the development of, uh, uh, of their shells as they grow. It's an international problem, and, and I know that there's no one silver bullet to solve it, but it's something that uh, we need to step up efforts to and, uh, and take a look at. And that'll conclude my comments, and I, I thank you for allowing me to testify here before you today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Buddy Lane, and um, I'm an elected representative of our uh, of my people here at Salets, and this is my father. And uh, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, growing up in Salets in this community here uh, on the Oregon coast. Um, I recently turned 40, so all of my life I've lived under uh, this decree but that's not stopped um, my family and other Sluts families from gathering our traditional foods, clams and, and mussels and seaweed and the fish in the streams and um, interacting with uh, uh, the materials we need for our basketry and all the things that go into our, our traditional lifestyles. Um, it's... Uh, I guess a good way to put it was uh, kind of a, a cloud has hung over um, 
folks when they engage in these activities fear and and misunderstanding um and it's on both sides uh, uh i think i spent a lot of time thinking about uh, the decree itself and um how it came into be and uh, i think fear and um uh, mistrust uh can i explain it well uh for, for myself at least fear of the unknown i suppose what, what was possible um and and from from the tribe side to uh, what the repercussions could have been without you know if we were not to sign it in 1980 um so um that pervade for 43 years too uh i have uh, had multiple interactions with um game wardens and um police during hunting season and uh it's always confusion and no one um really wanting to uh uh uh, put themselves out there. Oftentimes, when I'd be checked during hunting season, I'd show them my tribal ID, and they'd say, "That's that's enough. I don't. We don't need to go any further." And I tell them, "Oh, we have a process, and we have stickers, and you know, um, that shows we lawfully got permits issued to us from our tribe um, to use those state tags." Um, and we've had district attorneys here that would, when folks were unfortunately cited, would not prosecute them. So it was always this uh, thing that no one really uh, saw as being on solid moral footing. So I really want to thank um, everyone here uh, that's put in this work and engaged in this dialogue, um, openness, and uh, councils that preceded me um, in my time here, um, engaging in a meaningful way, government to government, community to community, um, and coming up with this and building trust. Um, we all, uh, I refer to them as relatives. Lots of people refer to them as resources, uh, the things we all depend on here uh, that don't have a voice and we need to speak for them and protect them. The fish in our streams, uh, the mountains, our forests, our oceans, the intertidal zones. Um, and I don't see the, I don't see competition or adversaries. I see allies uh, all in this room. We all have uh, a goal of making sure generations beyond ourselves will be able to enjoy these things. Um, so again, uh, thank you for the time and I hope this agreement um, comes through. Thank you both. Um, but I do have one quick question for you, just following up on what you said. You talked about um, climate change resilience and the kelp forest and a couple other things. Could you talk just a bit about how this might help your work on those fish and wildlife issues and um, how that work fits with your other, you know, where does it fit in the fish and wildlife work that you do? Well, I actually, when I worked for the Celeste tribes, and I'm on, I'm vice chairman of the tribal council. I, I was a traditional arts uh, teacher and gatherer. So, um, first of all, just for foods, by gathering clams, but we also make uh, what we call tsundake, and it's a uh, clamshell money that we highly value. All the tribes uh, in the Northwest highly value it, and they're, they're disc shells that are cut from them. So there's a dual purpose. You get something really good to eat, but you can also make some money. And, uh, uh, and this is not money in the sense of stocks and bonds uh, or the... the we normally think of it's more ceremonial in in nature and of high value to our people as as a trade item. But um, overall, the the uh, the work that the Alaka Alliance does it, and they're the ones doing it. The Sluts Tribe has been um, assisting in different ways, in small ways. Uh, but any any work that uh, enhances and uh, uh, helps to build back that ecosystem, and as my son said, protect those beings that can't fight for themselves, that can't speak for themselves. It's our responsibility as human beings to make sure that those other life forms, um, uh, they're our brothers and sisters too, that they have a right to be here and uh, and, and generations also uh, in the future, we should make sure that that, that uh, resource is available to them and that not just um, the food source goes away, but also the traditional and ceremonial uses of it uh, remain. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we'll go. 
No other questions. So thank you very much. And we will hear then from Bonnie Patterson, Peterson. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. yes. Thank you. And then the last person um, is Brian McLaughlin. Good afternoon. I'm Bonnie Peterson. I'm a tribal elder and a member of the tribal council and most importantly, a grandma and a great grandma. And I just want to relate the story of how, of the importance of hunting and um, to with from a personal level from the family. When my grandson, who's 22 now, and he's in Arizona fighting fire right now in the or White River or White Mountain Apache tribe, he um, got his first deer was he was 16 years old. And when he got that deer, it was butchered and it was wrapped up and put into the freezer. And then after a few months, we held what was called a first kill ceremony to acknowledge that. And at this ceremony, um, he had to give away his rifle that he had um, shot that deer with and he gave away his knife and he gave it to a younger, a younger a person younger than him. And that just carries on the tradition. The meat that came out of the freezer, was distributed to all the people who were there in attendance, family and community members. I got the hide that someone tanned. Um, then we held a, a, a general giveaway after the end of dinner. But I just want to say, this, it's so important to us because it's our future generations. Can we do these things so that everyone understands that that's your obligation? This is um, how you contribute within your tribe. And it was a very, it was, it was first kill ceremony. I had first kill ceremony I had attended and it was, it really made an impression on me. And I look forward to the dive. Held that hide, I'll be using it for my great grandson's outfit. And he'll hear the story of his dad's first kill and where that outfit came from. So that buckskin nut that will be on his outfit. I just want to share that. Mm, that was great. Thank you. Any comments, questions? Thank you very much. That was great. Um, we do have one more person, Brian McLaughlin. Can Go you ahead, Brian. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Good afternoon again, commissioners and Director Melcher. My name is Brian McLaughlin. I live in Portland, Oregon. Uh, this testimony is meant as a continuation of my prior testimony. And so it applies to both of the MOAs before the commission today as it did my prior testimony. A critical aspect of the MOA is that I would like to highlight the mission is that they expressly provide for either party, the state or tribe, if things go awry, which we all hope they do not, but if they do, that each party may exit the agreement at will without cause after satisfying some procedural requirements. In my view, this keeps the agreements, this keeps these government to government agreements voluntary and consensual moored in the political arena and importantly, out of the courts. It incentivizes both sides to work out differences, to find mutually acceptable solutions, and to make necessary compromises. It also lessens my concern of the state getting locked into some terms in the MOAs that I find to be problematic. Finally, I want to acknowledge a very positive aspect of these MOAs. Like others, I recognize and am hopeful that the MOAs will increase the efficacy of tribal efforts to conserve and enhance our fish and wildlife resources and the habitat on which they depend to the benefit of all Oregonians. The tribes bring much needed resources and influence along with their long-term perspective and traditional cultural knowledge to these issues and could play an invaluable role in conserving and sustaining our fish and wildlife and hopefully there are hunting and fishing opportunities in these environmentally challenging times. I know the tribes are already doing some of this and working in cooperative partnership with ODFW should enhance these efforts. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide testimony today. Thank you. Any questions, commissioners? Thank you, Brian. I think then, commissioners, we can ask Davia to come back up and Anyone wants to come back up with her or if you're just worn out with this? <laughs> she got her coat. Oh, okay. <laughs> she was blending in. <laughs> and thank you by the uh, by the way, Chair, for the offer of the book. Oh. A former conservation director for one of the tribes for the Confederated Tribes of the Kusloramqua and Sayusla had given that to me years ago. So 
but I appreciated that you made that offer to us. It's a great book. It's good reading. Yes. Um, commissioners, comments, questions. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner just, Hatfield Hyde. Yeah, I just, I mean, each one of these agreements is so precious, right, that it just seems kind of overwhelming to be doing two of them in one day. Um, but I, I, just one comment that you made that um, really struck me, uh, having spent a lot of time around the Klamath tribes in, in the Klamath Basin, is that, that, that um, this is imp as important as, you know, uh, being reinstated as a tribe. That's a big deal it's, for you to feel that this is that important. And it's, it's, you know, to eat is to exist, right? To have- Makes the, us whole. Yeah. So anyway, I just, I'm just again, st struck by how important this is and, and uh, that we get an opportunity here to just do the next best thing, the next right thing, right? That's what we can do is the next right thing. And I hope, yeah, Thank you. enough. Thank you, Commissioner Spellbrink. Yeah, <clears throat> Let's see if I can talk. <laughs> yeah, having been, you know, from the Sluts area for the last 40 plus years, uh, you know, I fished and hunted around tribal members uh, for most of that time. And I, and I tell you, I greatly respect them all. You know, and and uh, as an ODF and other representative, you know, I look forward to working with you guys on natural resources air, resource uh, issues. And I really like what Mr. Lane said: not adversaries, but allies. I think that says it all right there. And I really appreciate it. And when it comes time being this let's area, I would love to make the motion. Good point. We'll remember that, <laughs> Mr. Lampart. <laughs> Go ahead, Vice Chair. Mine's, <clears throat> excuse me, mine's a, a comment, and um, this I've, I really appreciate um, participating in in uh, approving these agreements. Um, but I also want to say that uh, we near you folks nearly filled the room um, the, to this year this uh, meeting. And uh, we haven't had this much participation since maybe the, the beaver <laughs> issue. <laughs> so I'm glad that we had as many chairs as we did. But thank you for all coming to. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Bud, good to see you again, sir. Good to see you. Um, an, another big deal. And um, just as the other commissioner said, you know, we want to make sure that we prioritize these into not, well, here's another one. This is a big deal for the Celeste tribe. Yep. And I want to particularly thank Davia and Director Melcher for your work in coming to an agreement with the, with the Celeste tribe to put this together in something that everybody can support. So I want to acknowledge you two for the work that you've done on too. So big deal. Thank you. Did you have another comment? Commissioner? No. I did want to just I keep forgetting. say a couple things. One is I echo the thought that hearing, I mean, I thought I knew a tiny bit about these after all these years, and I learned a huge amount today, mostly perspective and what's important um, other than beyond that they're deeply important to you, and a bit of that is also on our side. Um, it also... That comment impressed me with how exactly how important it was for the Grand Ron and the comments that we heard earlier. Um, if it's, you know, if restoration is, if this is second to restoration, how important this is. Um, so well taken. Um, and I look forward to a yes vote on this one. So with that, we will turn to Commissioner Spellbrink. Okay, I'm going to say it again, allies, not adversaries. I move to approve the draft memorandum of agreement in attachment three and adopt new OAR 635-800-0500 as proposed by staff and shown in attachment four. And I second. 
It's been moved and seconded that we move to approve the draft memorandum of agreement in attachment three as read into the record. And we will do a roll call vote on this one if we could. Hatfield Hyde? Yes. King? Yes. Labhart? Yes. Spellbring? Yes. Zarnowitz? Yes. Wall? Yes. Okay. And the right? don't go away because I understand there is a song that I know. I just said everything I know about it. So whoever's in charge of this. Oh, one, Davia. Craig pointed out we have zero 0200 somewhere, but we, that may have been from December. We may have changed it, Rob. Okay. Let me look at how we noticed it. Okay. Aaron, Aaron. All three in motion. Give us just a second, folks. Yeah, one is zero five. Who's causing trouble? One is zero five hundred and one is zero zero five zero. So they're different by one number oh, transposed. Okay. Zero five zero. I think that we noticed it this way in December and then we Okay. I'm sorry. The one I have has zero two hundred on it. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> just want to be sure it was right. So what we did just did is the right number. Is that right? Aaron confirming. I <laughs> let's get it right. This matters, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is there an addendum? <laughs> There's no addendum. <laughs> no addendum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the numbers are remarkably yeah, similar. Really <laughs> yeah. It's like a bill we had passed in Congress and they didn't include the so, colloquy. It was at midnight, December 31st, and they unpassed it. Oh. <laughs> Watching it on TV. And then passed, <laughs> and then passed it again. Oh, geez. <laughs> hey, Davia, it looks like Chair Wall it's noticed as 005. Zero. After the song, do we get to have a this little zero, 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 zero. Yes. Okay. This is the June notice. Is zero zero five zero? Because I mean, they're all similar. That's zero zero five zero zero five zero 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 three zero zero. Yeah, and that's okay. You know, this is enough to make, make sure you don't blind. Zero zero five zero. Who knew that one number? <laughs> one number two times. <laughs> Here's the packet. Oh, is there in there? the end of the <coughs> I think we should do this as zero zero five zero fifty because that's how we have it. Yeah, I'm actually looking at the OER. Yeah. Well, what do we do? Um, it hasn't been this one. Yeah. We did 500. Okay. Yeah. In the last version. No, it was filed with the Secretary of State. We did do it again. Yeah, zero zero five zero. So what has happened? We don't the numbers transpose. Yeah. yeah. Zero zero five zero. So can we but give the correct the number cruise. to the motion? We just want to make that say yes. Zero zero five zero. That's how you notice today. <laughs> What did you read? I'm sorry. I read 0500. Yeah. 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 Looking at G and H, did we get the transpose? Well, that's the one. That's the previous. one before it. Oh, wonderful. Too. Look at yeah. G. Oh, okay. yeah. We it's in. It's in. We'll sort it out. Well, we turn it in. Okay. On the administrative institute. Well, I want to say that. That's what you uh, okay. Oh, you know that you've been. Do we need to revoke? So if I may, I'm looking at the one that was filed with the Secretary of State on 425, and it says zero zero five zero zero. Are you in attachment? Or exhibit. He was looking at an earlier, an April one. <clears throat> I'm, I'm looking at what was filed with the Secretary of State on 425 2003 at 1240, and it's 635500, which is what? Okay, 0500, and that's Select, not CTQC. Yeah, that's Select. Okay, okay, good, then you had it right. Yeah, that's what you read earlier. 0500. That's the CTQC one, I think. We got it right. Yeah, we got it right. We got it right. Good to catch up. Yay. And then we are there, and I think that we now give it to John George. 
Oh, we gave it to somebody else. Do you need a microphone or anything? Yeah, that'd be good. Oh, no. That'd be good. No. <laughs> you want the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to pass them down yeah, the commissioners? I'd be happy to. Points. You got it. Thank, thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So here's what I read. This is what was filed. Yeah. This is page there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. And I was. Yeah, nice. Okay. Yeah, good. Thank you. about a big change that's coming. So people can yes. Talk so about it. Yeah. let's meet up for a minute. Five minutes, and we'll be back for the rest of the agenda. Well, yeah. I actually heard from it. Yeah.
California Current. Um, from about 300 to the mid 1900s. And you can see that that goes up and down and up and down. And throughout that 1700 year history, there wasn't a uh, commercial fishery until about 1900. So people think that it's the environment not fisheries that drive this population dynamic. And what that is, we can talk a little bit more about. So a little bit about the biology. The uh, sardine uh, get to be 12 to 15 inches long. They can live up to 13 years. Most of them are a lot uh, less than that. Uh, they start reproducing at age one. Um, they're plankton feeders, and they can be found out to 300 nautical miles from the near shore. There are actually three different subpopulations or stocks um, along the West Coast. Uh, one in only one of them is in the federal fishery management plan, and that's the northern stock or northern subpopulation. And here you see over on the right um, a diagram that was uh, based on a model that shows the available habitat, and that was originally used to say, where are we going to do our trawl surveys, acoustic trawl surveys? But it also goes into, plays into management as well. That... Uh, model has been changed and their stock structure is a big deal. All of the fish that are caught in U.S. waters are attributed to the northern subpopulation. But the reality is, is that a lot of the fish that are actually caught are from the southern subpopulation and they come up into the California bite. And you can see that there's an overlap. This is the results of this stock structure workshop. And with the last assessment, there were so many problems with it that both the Scientific Statistical Committee and the uh, Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team recommended to the council that there not be an assessment this year. Usually there's one every single year. There wasn't one this year. Instead, they held this stock structure workshop. And they adjusted the model, and now the fish that are caught down in Mexico are attributed to the southern uh, substock. And so the model no longer has to make fish to account for what's caught down there. So it's a big deal. And part of the reason that I'm telling you this is because we don't have a biomass estimate this year to base the um, uh, harvest specifications on. Rather, the Scientific and Statistical Committee rolled over the overfishing limit and uh, made some adjustments after that. So that's what we're basing um, the federal regulations on. So there's over 100 years of uh, the fishery. Uh, it's management and science that has gone into it. I'm, I, I can give you more details, but I'm going to focus on recent times. Uh, in 2015, the sardine, uh, the directed fishery was closed because the biomass fell below 150,000 metric tons, which is the limit in the uh, um, uh, federal fishery management plan to have a directed sardine fishery. In 2019, the stock was down below 50,000 metric tons. And that is the over, they were declared overfished, even though people don't think that it's fishing that played, that, that made that happen. It's rather the environmental conditions. Um, a 20, in 2020, a federal rebuilding plan was uh, adopted. Um, in 2021, there was a tri-national sardine survey. Now, that's pretty amazing, given that it was a COVID year, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And in 2022, we had that stock structure workshop that I just mentioned. So um, lots of partners in the federal management plan, the uh, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, states, industry, um, and people from Mexico, and they look at, you know, what, what they see out there. Um, and I will say that in 2022, they were going to go into Mexico again. They got permits to do that. They weren't able to get up into Canada because the federal vessel couldn't get out. And so industry partners did all of the work in the northern part of the California current from the Canadian border all the way down to Bodega Bay. 
uh, sardine are a big part of the forage base in the California current system. And you can see from this graph from about 2008 up through 2021 that not only the biomass, but the species composition changes dramatically. And back in the early years, it was largely sardine. Um, in most recent years, it's largely northern anchovy of the central uh, subpopulation of northern anchovy. There's other species in here, and that's just part of the forage base. There's other things that, uh, but those are the um, some of the coastal pelagic species that make up that. So a little bit about climate change and sardine. Um, some of these climate uh, uh, drivers, in quotes, um, that have been looked at include sea surface temperature, which is actually part of the harvest control rules, although it's been changed, which Indrex is using there. Wind stress curl further offshore. Um, the Pacific decadal oscillation has also been um, correlated with it. But all of these things are just correlations. They're not cause and effect. We don't know the cause and effect. Recently, there has been a, a more mechanistic uh, uh, thing proposed, food availability um, for the juveniles. And that is yet to be looked at or determined um, very clearly. But the predictions for the future include that the catch is going to increase over time when the uh, population becomes reestablished in the northern part of the California current. And it will decrease in the central and the southern part of the California current. And that's consistent with many other species that are moving and changing their range over time as our uh, um, planet warms up. But I think one of the most important uh, um, things um, about this is the fact that that was in another paper in 2013 that said essentially that as our climate changes, we get unexpected results and things that we can't make uh, that, that are surprising because they're not what was observed with history. So our predictions become less and less certain. There we go. Okay, so here we are at the harvest specifications. Um, the overfishing limit that was rolled over is 5,000 506 metric tons. Um, there was an added buffer because there wasn't an assessment. So the allowable biological catch and the annual catch limit were, were, uh, are lower than they were um, last year at 3,953 metric tons. Again, there is no directed fishery. Um, so the harvest guideline for that is zero. And um, there's an annual catch target, which triggers some additional management measures at 3,600 metric tons. The additional... Um, <coughs> Not sure what happened there. Oh, there they are. The additional um, uh, for uh, management measures that were adopted by the um, uh, council and uh, transmitted to the National Marine Fisheries Service are that there's a limit on bycatch in other coastal pelagic species of 20% by weight for sardine. Um, the live bait fishery, which is where most of the sardine are being caught down in Southern California, has a, if they get to 2,500 metric tons, there's a one metric ton limit that applies to that fishery. And then um, if that annual catch target of 3,600 metric tons is attained, there's a one metric ton limit that applies to all coastal pelagic species fisheries. And of course, there are um, there is some bycatch in other uh, fisheries that aren't targeting coastal pelagic species, such as the hake fishery. And there's a two metric ton um, sardine limit per trip for those fisheries. I'm not quite sure why there's a blank there. All right. 
Moving along to uh, sand lance, that's one of those uh, 480 other species that we uh, um, you don't hear too much about. Um, Pacific sand lance are all in the genus Amadites, and they're found throughout the world. But here in the North, in the North Pacific, um, there was recent work uh, by a paper by James Orr uh, in 2015 that looked at the genus throughout the entire North Pacific and the surrounding seas, and they used uh, DNA and um, morphology to uh, look at them. And all the little black dots there—I don't know if there's a pointer on this or not—but uh, all the black dots that go from the tip of the Aleutian Islands all the way down and along our coast are um, are what they determined to be Amadites hexapteris, and that is now called the Pacific Sandlands or the Pacific Sandlands, and now has that scientific name. Whereas before it was called uh, Amadites hexapteris, and that is now the Arctic Sandlands. So just a flip flop of the two names uh, there, and then there's uh, a couple of species over in Japan. And um, with that, I will take questions. I don't know what happened to my question slide. Oh, wait. Oh, the options in the draft motion. Well, the options are to adopt the federal, uh, the uh, Oregon administrative rules that were presented with the package or to modify that. Uh, and staff recommends that you adopt the regulations um, as proposed. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Commissioner King. Just and then Vice Chair Zarnowitz. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know about yet another of the 420. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess I'm looking at our little motion sheet. It really is a question. It, we're doing two things, right? Aren't we renaming a species or something or other? Yeah, but it's all in one package um, because they're all of those uh, Oregon administrative rules are related to coastal pelagic species. And so it's all in the same uh, group of a uh, larger group of uh, Oregon administrative rules. But yes, well, that's not entirely true because there's one that's in the uh, shellfish group, but it's still it's still a coastal pelagic species, so it's all related. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Go ahead, Commissioner Zarnowitz. Um, yeah, and I asked you this in the uh, pre-commission meeting, but um, so these fish, the sardines, and actually a lot of, you call them forage fish, so uh, they're very important for not only seals, but whales, and uh, like humpback whales, and the sardines are, uh, are important for that. So the question I have is, does um, uh, the federal fisheries um, take into account uh, not only just the population and what we can harvest from it, but how much might be needed for, as a forage fish, just for the wildlife that forages on them, salmon included. Right. There are a lot of different uh, species that eat um, not only sardine, but also anchovy and Pacific sandlands and um, uh, a variety of, uh, of forage and none of them are specialists on sardine. And as you might've seen in that graph that I showed, the forage base itself in the California current, even just the forage fish base is very high right now. Um, and a lot of that is, you know, uh, anchovy. So um, yes, that is taken into consideration. And with the um, uh, a look at the uh, California, the state of the California current system that was presented um, from with uh, in March, um, that information is available in the March briefing book um, uh, at the council. They looked at um, you know the birds and the uh, sea lion pups as they use as indicators of the forage base. And all of those seem to be doing re uh, quite well right now. Um, and uh, and so, yes, the, that, that is taken into consideration. But at the same time, we have now more humpbacks hanging out along the Oregon coast. 
Yes, there are there are humpbacks uh, found off the Oregon coast, um, and there are three uh, distinct population segments of those, two of which are on the endangered species list, and uh, they are um, seen out here. They primarily humpbacks primarily don't eat sardine um they do eat herring and the herring um resource off of our waters seems to be pretty good but uh, those are the fish that they eat but primarily they're eating krill that is their primary thing and i was just out with um, colleagues from oregon state university the other day doing some photo id work and biopsy work to look at the humpbacks that were out there and we actually were able to scoop some poop um, to get uh, a good look at what they actually were eating. Oh, good. And it was krill? Um, I have not seen the analysis yet because it was just a week or so ago, but uh, it looked like krill. <laughs> yeah. You had to ask. Didn't you? <laughs> um, okay, thank you. I have a couple questions, Greg. Um, the, is there an alternative bait instead of sardine? And I recognize that it that we're not that it's not a huge amount that we're using for our for bait um uh, i guess i I'm, can you clarify your question in terms yeah, if of they, if people oh you mean for, for live bait. bait down in southern california yes. is that what you're talking about yes. they use both anchovy and they use sardine and there is a preference um of the it, that is a really economically very important um, uh, fishery down there. Uh, it's, you know, I mean, the expanded effect is is huge because there's a lot of uh, these commercial fishing boats and even private boats that go to these bait barges and they get some of the live bait on board and then they go out and fish for tuna. And the sardine lasts better than the anchovy is what I'm told by um, uh, folks that do that. And um, sometimes the uh, fish have a definite preference as well. The tuna have a definite preference as well. So it's an important um, economic driver uh, down there in Southern California. Uh, and they do collect both anchovy and sardine. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, just if I could, just one second, I had a couple more and then I'll, yeah. The um, other question I have relates to the one that Vice Chair Zarnowitz asked, and it's on whom do we rely for El Nino and La Nina impacts and recommended response? I mean, we know that stuff's coming. It's here this year with one of them and yeah, Who does um, that for us. The uh, the information comes from uh, the National Weather Service Climate Prediction Office, and on June eighth, uh, they said we are now in a El Nino, and it's likely to get stronger through the um, upcoming winter twenty three twenty four, uh, an increase um, in, in intensity um, over that time. Time period, uh, uh, but El Nino itself has not been correlated with uh, the sardine population. Um, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is a longer-term sort of thing, has um, uh, been correlated with the uh, um, uh, sardine population uh, increases or decreases. But that uh, that correlation, like that of sea surface temperature. It has tended to break down. Um, there's a paper that shows that it has broken down for sea surface temperature. Um, that was published in 2019. But El Nino or, or the uh, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the, the correlation still held, although it appeared to be getting weaker. Um, so again, as our climate changes, what we've seen in the past may not be what we get in the future. And so we hear from the weather folks, and then who interprets that for us in terms of what that's going to do to our fishery? Oh, um, a lot of that goes into the uh, the that uh, uh, integrated eco ecological um, the IEA assessment. 
okay. ecological assessment. And that is um, presented to the Pacific Fishery Management Council every March. And um, that document and the presentation is available um, and, and you can, um, you know, at least at least read the information that's in the briefing book there. Um, and I can send you a, a direct link if you would like at some point in the future. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Spellbrink. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, I was just going to make a quick observation. There is a, a small live bait fishery in Winchester Bay down there, you know, on the mouth of the Umpqua that uh, on most years they'll have a few sardines. If some sardines come into the bay, they just kind of catch what's in the bay. But I mean, it would be a metric ton or two, I'm guessing, something like that. They you know, they do a beautiful job of uh, packing their bait. They, you know, vacuum pack them in 12 trays and it's like five bucks a tray. So it's, you know, it's it, it, economically, they make, they make quite a bit of money out of it, but it's handling very few fish actually. Yeah. The only one I know of in Oregon. Yeah. And that, that actually is, is what we call a minor directed fishery because it isn't actually live. As you said, it's vacuum packed and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's different than what they have in San Diego, where they'll, they'll take a scoop of live fish that they hold on these barges and put them into a live well on these commercial, uh, on these boats. So they they're actually going out. do that in Winchester Bay too. They have live yeah. ends where they starve okay. them actually before they, before they even vacuum, freeze right. them, vacuum yeah. them. So, yeah. and people that fish locally for, uh, salmon and for uh, striped bass, they'll go down and buy the live ones too out of it. So, so they have the live pens and yeah. there they freeze them. But anyway, it's small operation, mm -hmm. but it is, that's the only one I know of in Oregon. That's the only one that I know of as well. Thank you. No other questions? Let's do a motion on this one and then we'll do item F. Okay, I'll read the motion. I'll make sure I'm reading the right one. Yeah. Let's see, right? Okay. <laughs> I move to adopt the amended OARs in Division 004 and 005 as presented by staff in Attachment 3. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the amended OARs in Division 004 and 005 as just read into the record. Let's do a thumbs vote on this one. Those in favor, it's everybody, Michelle. And so thank you to you, Greg. Um, thank you for hanging with us all day long. And we will move to item F. And thank here comes you. Brian. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> They're always so pleasant. They're all mixed up. Yeah. I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, where are we? <laughs> Chair Wall, Vice Chair Zarnowitz, Director Melcher, members of the commission, for the record, Brian Wolfer, Acting Wildlife Division Administrator. I'm here to seek your approval for 2024 auction and raffle tag allocations. The Access and Habitat Board is recommending that you allocate five auction and five raffle deer tags and the same for elk. Staff is recommending that you uh, allocate one raffle and one auction tag for bighorn sheep and the same for pronghorn and Rocky Mountain goat. The funds generated from these tags are dedicated funds for deer and elk. Those are dedicated to access and habitat. For bighorn sheep, Rocky Mountain goat, and pronghorn, those funds are dedicated to the management of those species. Uh, if you um, do approve this allocation, the Access and Habitat Board will select the host organizations for the auction deer and elk tags. Staff will select the host organizations for the auction bighorn sheep, Rocky Mountain and goat and pronghorn tags, and you will see the results of those selections in September with the big game packet. There's additional detail in your packet, including some history over the last decade or so of the funds generated from these tags. And with that, uh, Dr. Don Whitaker, uh, ungulate coordinator and Travis Schultz, our access and habitat program coordinator are available virtually to help answer questions if you have any, but will not be presenting any additional information. Thank you. Can't tell you how much your brevity is appreciated at this time of day. And Commissioner King. Thank you, Chairwell. Yes, brevity is the soul of wit. I have a question. Uh, well, it's just for on uh, for Dr. Don, um, if he could just explain on record because I had the the real privilege of being a part of the wild sheep roundup out in Winnaha this 
earlier this year. And at that time, I learned from Dr. Uh, Whitaker, he would prefer mus mud wrestling with sheep than uh, present to the commission. So, um, <laughs> but we, <laughs> but what I did learn, what was important is um, that the funding from these sorts of things funds that entire operation. And so if he could maybe just explain it, I guess briefly, as we, as we know, time is always the, of the essence on the record so that people understand like what these auctions are for and do. Um, and maybe so the commission understands like what this, what this generates and how this helps the department in terms of furthering research and furthering so many of the programs that we all go out and do. Um, yeah, Chair Wall, Commissioner Thing, thank you. Um, for the record, Don Whitaker, I am the Angular Coordinator here at headquarters in Salem. Um, that's correct. These funds for these tags are very critical to a lot of our programs. Um, by hook and by crook and begging and borrowing, we were able to start restoration of our bighorn sheep as an example um, 70 years ago for the first auction and raffle program began in 1987 for bighorn sheep. And with that income that was statutorily dedicated, it provided a resource so that we could step up the game and get a little bit more uh, active in that. And since that program has started, Oregon actually has become one of the leaders in restoration and research and management. Uh, we're actively engaged with much of our work in bighorn sheep. These funds are also very critical for the Prawlhorn and Rocky Mountain Goat programs. They're doing the same thing. They're giving us funds where we can leverage other funding and do larger projects that um, are very important for informing our management decisions. Um, I do think we should allow Travis to address that because the funds are managed a little bit under different objectives for the deer and elk auction tags. But for bighorn sheep, pronghorn, and Rocky Mountain goat, um, they're used as match, which are the activities that you got to participate. And as a scientist looking at diagnosing things, that's very observant to prefer to observe that I prefer the mud with sheep and snow than I do, you know, formal meetings. So. Travis, would you like to add anything? Uh, sure. Uh, for the record, Travis Schultz, the Access and Habitat Coordinator. Um, this last biennium uh, auction and raffle sales uh, were about 1.1 million of A&H funds, which is uh, over 50% of our funding. So 50% of the Access, Habitat, and other projects that we do, this is what where, the, where those funds come from. Got it. And just to follow on with that, um, again, I had the opportunity to go do that roundup with Dr. Don Whitaker. And as he explained it, basically the entire operation was funded by the auction result of one bighorn sheep tag, essentially. I mean, from helicopters to the researchers to just everything there um, was funded by just these auction uh, tags, which is so that's really I've just to give it significance and what this is all for. I thought that that was really important to know. And, you know, to show the level of dedication of our scientists, literally after that roundup, he had to go to, I think it was the Rocky Mountain goat auction, you know, to, to, to sell that one off to, again, for further research. Thank you. Good point. So may I have a motion on this one? Okay. Where are we? Which one? F? It's F. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'll read it. I move to approve the 2024 auction and raffle big game tag allocations as proposed by staff and the ANH board and as shown in attachments two and three. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the 2024 auction and raffle big game tag allocations as read into the record. Those in favor, and we can do a thumb vote on this one, please. Looks like everyone, Michelle, thank you. Um, thank you, Brian. 
and to you, Travis and Don. Thank you. Um, we do have an executive session, so I'm going to read the legal fine print into the record, and then we will have an executive session. The commission will now meet in executive session. This executive session is to consider information or records that are exempt by law from public inspection as authorized by ORS 192.6602F, as well as to consult with legal counsel concerning legal rights and duties regarding real estate as authorized by ORS 192.662. H, 6602H. Under Oregon state law, executive sessions are closed to the public. Representatives of the news media are allowed to attend. Reporters are directed not to report on the discussions during executive session except to state the general subject. And as always, no decisions will be made in executive session. We will come back into session just to adjourn. So let's go to executive session and where is it? Um, it would be the lunchroom or here, whichever. I say we just do it right here. Let's stay here. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Mics are going off. Hold on. Let me. Make
Here you go. Very good. <laughs>